A December 2012 Pew Forum survey found that 1.1 billion, or about one in six people, 16% around the world, are completely unaffiliated with any religion. There are about twice as many unaffiliated in Europe, 134 million, compared to North America's 59 million, and an astonishing 858 million in Asia and the Pacific consider themselves unaffiliated with religion. China at 53% and Hong Kong at 56% are two of only six nations around the world where the religiously unaffiliated make up a majority of the population. While the United States is often looked at as a religious nation, a December 2012 Gallup poll revealed that 31% of Americans call themselves non-religious. The Pew survey also found that the United States was home to the third highest religiously unaffiliated population in the world. Many of these are atheists or agnostics. 32% of America's unaffiliated profess no belief at all in God or any kind of higher power. The number of non-religious or unaffiliated people are increasing around the globe. Almost 50 years ago, the God is Dead movement received prominence in an April 8, 1966 Time Magazine cover story. The stark black magazine cover asked in large red letters, Is God dead? My friends, is God the product of human imagination? Or does He really exist? Are scientists right to say that evolution explains human origins? Or does the evidence point to a God who created the universe and everything in it? Can you explain life and the universe without God? If there is a God, can you prove His existence? Is God alive? You can know, and you can know that you know God is alive. Stay tuned. Greetings to all our friends around the world. An April 8, 1966 Time Magazine cover story asked the question, Is God dead? Philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, whose philosophy was not merely atheistic, but was strongly anti-God, wrote, God is dead, but given the way of men, there may still be caves for thousands of years in which His shadow will be shown, and we we still have to vanquish his shadow, too. Nietzsche is now dead, but his philosophy lives on to this day in anti-God minds. One of the most vital questions we all need to answer is, does God exist, and can you prove it? A June 2011 Gallup poll found that 92% of Americans answered yes to the question, do you believe in God? Younger people, ages 18 to 29, were the least likely to respond affirmatively, with just 84% saying they believed in God. 94% of Americans over age 30 expressed belief in God. While the majority in China consider themselves to be religiously unaffiliated, it is interesting to note that 44% of the 700 million unaffiliated say they have worshipped at a graveside or tomb in the past year. Death certainly has a way of causing us to look to a higher power. How many of those who believe in God also believe that He created human beings? A Gallup poll in June 2012 found the following. 46% of Americans believe in the creationist view that God created humans in their present form at one time within the last 10,000 years. The prevalence of this creationist view of the origin of humans is essentially unchanged from 30 years ago when Gallup first asked the question. About a third of Americans believe that humans evolved, but with God's guidance. 
15% say humans evolved, but that God had no part in the process. In Canada and Britain, many more people believe in evolution. Listen to this finding from Angus Reid Public Opinion. In the online survey of representative national samples, two-thirds of Britons, 69%, and three in five Canadians, 61%, think human beings evolved from less advanced life forms over millions of years, a view shared by only 30% of Americans. An international survey conducted by the British Council asked, to what extent do you agree or disagree that enough scientific evidence exists to support Charles Darwin's theory of evolution? Posed to respondents who had heard of Charles Darwin and knew something about the theory of evolution. India led the list with 77% of respondents agreeing, with China second at 72%. My friends, how do you explain your existence? Does it have meaning? Is there a Creator God who exists and has purpose and meaning for you and for all human beings? Is God alive? Can you prove God exists? Our first fundamental proof of God's existence is creation demands a creator. We can prove the existence of a great creator God by examining the work of his hands. Did everything in existence come into being without cause? It is a scientific fact that you cannot have something form out of nothing. My friends, have you ever asked yourself why we are here? Has the universe existed from eternity? Not according to the famous astrophysicist Stephen Hawking. In a lecture on the beginning of time, Hawking stated this, the universe has not existed forever. Rather, the universe and time itself had a beginning in the Big Bang about 15 billion years ago. Yes, my friends, there was a time when the universe did not exist. There was a time when time did not exist. The Bible does not indicate when that was, but it agrees that the universe and time had a beginning. Astronomer Hugh Ross, Ph.D., researched galaxies and quasars at California Institute of Technology. He had this to say about cosmological discoveries. All the great cosmological discoveries of the 20th century fly in the face of materialist notions about the infinite random universe. On the contrary, they support the fact of a finite beginning caused by and guided by a divine, personal, caring designer who exists before and beyond the universe. Yes, one of the fundamental proofs for God's existence is creation demands a creator. Now consider another vital question. Where did life come from? Evolutionists have never been able to answer that question. Human beings have tried in vain to create life from non-life or even from chemicals in a laboratory. They have utterly failed. The law of biogenesis states that life can only come from life. My friends, let's understand. Another fundamental proof for God's existence is life demands a life giver. The Bible reveals that life originally came from the life giver. Turn in your Bible to Genesis 2nd chapter, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Or as the King James Version has it, man became a living soul. Here we're speaking of physical life. As we'll see later in the program, God is also the giver of spiritual life. A second proof for God's existence is, Life demands a life giver. Now, let's ask another question. How does the universe operate? What mechanisms or laws determine the expansion and motion of the universe? And where did those laws come from? Patrick Glynn, in his book, God the Evidence, writes that everything had to be just right from the very start. Everything from the values of fundamental forces like electromagnetism and gravity to the relative masses of the various subatomic particles, to things like the number of neutrino types at time one second, which the universe has to know 
already at 10 to the minus 43rd second. The slightest tinkering with a single one of scores of basic values and relationships in nature would have resulted in a universe very different from the one we inhabit, say one with no stars like our sun or no stars, period. Many of us may not understand this scientific description, but we can understand, as Patrick Glenn emphasizes, natural laws existed from the very beginning of creation. Scientists admit they had to be. As theoretical physicists Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose wrote, the only way to have scientific theory is if the laws of physics hold everywhere, including at the beginning of the universe. The existence of such marvelous, predictable laws in nature points to a master intelligence and lawgiver. Add to that evidence the existence of unseen spiritual laws, and you double the evidence of a great lawgiver. My friends, consider this fundamental proof of God's existence. Law demands a lawgiver. The existence of natural law in the universe is proof of a divine being enacting the laws. Scientists depend on the predictability and reliability of natural law for their calculations and search for truth. When science examines the smallest particle in the expanding universe, what does it find? It finds predictable natural laws in action, but it also finds intelligent design. Consider the human eye. Could such complexity evolve? Now scientists can examine structures small and large near and distant, from quarks and DNA to quasars and whole galaxies. And what do we see? We see a demonstration of perfection and design. Even Darwin admitted that complex organs such as the eye would be difficult to explain in terms of the process outlined by his theory. Newsweek magazine featured a 2005 article titled, Doubting Darwin. The author comments on the classic illustration of the eye. Jerry Adler writes that evolutionists have tried to show how a series of small improvements could eventually build the complete organ. With the publication of Darwin's Black Box in 1996, biochemist Michael Behe moved the argument to the cellular level using examples such as the immune system response. They exhibit what he calls irreducible complexity meaning that all their parts are necessary for them to function at all. This, he says, is the hallmark of intelligent design. If you would like to discover more about how this topic impacts your life, visit us online at www.lcgcanada.org to read our featured literature free of charge. My friends, as you study science, natural law, and life itself, consider the concepts of irreducible complexity and intelligent design. Proof number four of God's existence, design demands a designer. An increasing number of scientists find major flaws in the theory of evolution. One such organization is the Discovery Institute with offices in Seattle, Washington, and Washington, D.C. Discovery Institute senior fellow George Gilder, studying the simple cell, points out its great complexity. Perhaps you were taught in high school biology years ago that the cell is a simple element. Gilder points out that it is not so simple after all. It's a complex information processing machine comprising tens of thousands of proteins arranged in fabulously intricate algorithms of communication and synthesis. The human body contains some 60 trillion cells. Each one stores information in DNA codes, processes and replicates it in three forms of RNA and thousands of supporting enzymes, exquisitely supplies the system with energy and seals it in semi-permeable phospholipid membranes. It is a process subject to the mathematical theory of information, which shows that even mutations occurring in cells at the gigahertz pace of a Pentium 4 and selected at the rate of a Google search couldn't beget the intricate interwoven fabric of structure and function of a human being in such a short amount of time. 
Natural selection should be taught for its important role in the adaptation of species. But Darwinian materialism is an embarrassing cartoon of modern science. Quite an indictment of evolution. We've seen that God has given us overwhelming physical evidence of His existence. As we've seen, creation demands a creator. Life demands a life giver. Law demands a lawgiver. And design demands a designer. These four proofs demonstrate a higher intelligence behind the universe. Can we understand that higher intelligence by examining the mystery of human consciousness and rational thought? Can scientists explain consciousness? Dr. Robert L. Kuhn holds a doctorate in anatomy brain research from UCLA and has done extensive research on the human brain and mind. He is the creator and host of the public television series Closer to Truth. In his book, Closer to Truth, Challenging Current Belief, he and several scholars discuss the question, what is consciousness? Dr. Kuhn asks, why is consciousness such a mystery? Dr. John Searle, author of the book, The Mystery of Consciousness, answered this way, we don't know how to explain it. Compare consciousness to physics. We're doing pretty well in physics, even though we have some puzzling areas like quantum mechanics. We don't have an adequate theory of how the brain causes conscious states, and we don't have an adequate theory of how consciousness fits into the universe. Can human consciousness be explained by understanding the spiritual dimension of mankind? Is it possible, my friends, that the Bible can fill the gap in some of these mysteries? Yes, it can. As we've discussed in previous programs, Dr. Searle points out that the traditional explanations for consciousness are dualism and materialism. He states, so the big choice today is between dualism, which says that we live in two separate worlds, a mental world and a physical world, and materialism, which says, no, it's all physical. Dualism relies much on the belief in the pagan doctrine of the immortal soul. As we've demonstrated on this program several times, the Bible teaches that human beings are living souls and that souls can die. They are not immortal. Not only is the dualist wrong in his belief, but the materialist is also wrong because he denies the existence of the non-physical dimension, the spirit realm. What does the Bible reveal? If you have a Bible, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul discusses the relationship of spirit to humans. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Paul is not discussing an immortal soul, but the human spirit. The human spirit enables humans to know the things of a man. Animals cannot know the things of a man. Animals cannot think on the human level. The difference between human mind and animal brain in terms of qualitative characteristics is enormous. Please understand, our human brains are not incapable of understanding the existence of the most important dimension of all, the spiritual dimension. If scientists can theorize multiple dimensions, we should be able to grasp the obvious. My friends, the most important dimension is the spiritual dimension, generally ignored by science. But to truly and deeply understand the spiritual dimension, we need the Spirit of God. Then one can truly understand the things of God, as the Apostle Paul stated in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. And how does one receive the Spirit of God? Read Acts 2, verse 38. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So far, we've examined four fundamental proofs of God's existence. They are, proof number one, creation demands a creator. Proof number two, life demands a life giver. Proof number three, law demands a lawgiver. And proof number four, design demands a designer. 
In addition to the proofs of creation, life, natural law, intelligent design, there is a spiritual dimension. You can prove that God exists. He is the God of creation, the God of your Bible. He's revealed awesome truths that science cannot discover. The spiritual dimension is another proof of God's existence. My friends, God's existence is sure. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1 verse 20 that those who deny the evidence are without excuse. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Evolution cannot explain and mostly denies the existence of spirit. The greatest reality is not material existence, but the existence of spirit, as it tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The Apostle John also proclaims this truth in John 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now add the spiritual dimension to those proofs we discussed, and you double the evidence. Not only has God created the physical universe, but He has been and is right now creating the spiritual masterpiece of His creation, godly character in humble, yielded, genuine Christians. He is also the lawgiver of spiritual law, the two great commandments given in Matthew 22 verses 37 through 39 and the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Those laws are just as real as the natural laws. In addition to giving physical life, God is also the spiritual life giver. The golden verse of the Bible makes that plain, John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We are created in God's image for a great and awesome purpose. God wants us to think like He thinks. He wants us to become like Him in nature and character. And so He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to give us an example of godly life and character and to save us from our sinful nature. God wants us to be conformed to the very loving image and character and nature of Christ as it tells us in Romans 8, 29. Philosophers claim that God is dead, but many of these philosophers themselves are dead, and God is alive. Psalm 14 and verse 1 gives us a clear perspective on that reality. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. My friends, can you prove God exists? Yes, you can. Not only can you know God exists, but you can know that you know He's alive. Turn in your Bible to 1 John 2 and verse 3. Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked. You can prove God's existence by living the way of life he's revealed through the Bible. And further, you can come to know Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. My friends, consider the evidence we presented on this program.
there is much more evidence available. Another very significant way to prove God's existence is through the promise given in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 29. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find Him, if you seek Him with all your heart and with all your soul. Once you've proven the existence of God, the next logical question is, how can I know what He expects of me? You need to prove that the Bible is the inspired Word of God and is the method through which He communicates His expectations, His plans, and even His very character. Please visit the website, which will be shown on the screen momentarily, to read or download our booklet, The Bible, Fact or Fiction. This booklet examines several verifiable proofs of the authenticity of Scripture as the written Word of God. In it, you'll discover archaeological discoveries which corroborate the biblical narrative, detailed accounts of events centuries before they take place, as well as other important facts to consider in verifying the authenticity of Scripture. And be sure to join us every week on the Tomorrow's World program. Gerald Weston and I will continue to share with you the teachings of Jesus Christ and the exciting end-time prophecies and their meaning. We'll also continue to give you special perspectives on Bible prophecy and Christian living. So be sure to join us again next week right here at this same time. If you would like to discover more about how this topic impacts your life, visit us online at www.lcgcanada.org to read our featured literature free of charge. The preceding program has been produced by the Living Church of God.